Hello, everyone. I just want to show something I'm really excited about is that I now have a RAG application that can work fully with Olama, including working inside a GitHub code space using Olama inside the code space. So I'm really excited about it. So let's just check it out. So this is my RAG on PostgreSQL solution. And I say mine, but we now have more contributors to it, like uh, John Aziz. So uh, this is our RAG on PostgreSQL solution. And you can find this repo from my GitHub. Uh, it's GitHub slash Azure Samples slash RAG Postgres OpenAI Python. And uh, by default, it assumes that you're going to use Azure OpenAI and then deploy to, to Azure. Uh, but we do have support for being able to use other OpenAI providers like Olama and uh, being able to run it all locally with a local Postgres. So here it is running locally and it is, let me go ahead and really uh, show it, right? So it is running locally here. I also have it running in a code space, right? And it is using a local Postgres. So it's just using, you know, the Postgres um, local port and that's all set up inside the in the dev container so it's got that local postgres with pg vector enabled there so that's the postgres it's using and then it is how i have it configured today is to use olama for the uh for all the models right so uh what you can see here this is my dot emv and in the dot emv you know i connect to the postgres and then for the open ai we have a chat host and an embed host so here I say my chat host is a llama and also my embed host is a llama. So we're using a llama for both of them. And then this is the configuration that we need for a llama. So first is the endpoint. So you can see that this endpoint here is actually pointing at host.docker.internal. Uh, this is because I'm actually running inside a dev container on my machine, but Olama over here is running on, you know, my actual machine. So this lets it reach outside the dev container to find, um, you know, the local host that's on my machine and hits up the, uh, you know, the Olama server and the OpenAI compatible endpoint at slash v1. So that, uh, that reaches out to the Olama server. Then I specify the chat model. So Llama 3.1 is working really well for me. That came out recently and supports function calling, which we want. And then for the embed model, I'm using Nomic embed tests, which seems to work pretty well. And then I also specify what column of data to use in the database. And the reason I did this is so that I could easily switch between different embedding models, right? Because for uh, Azure and OpenAI.com, I'm using ADA002 for the embeddings and for vector search. But when I'm using with a llama, I you know need to use a model that I can call on a llama. So there I'm specifying uh, the nomic embedding, right? So if we actually look at my database here, so look at the local database and look at the tables in it. And what we can see is, you know, these are all the things that we're searching. This is fake data for a outdoor products website, you know, like an REI or something. And uh, what we have is the embedding column. So you can see embedding ADA002 is a column. And so that would have 1,536 dimensions. And then we have embedding NOMIC, which has a different number of dimensions. Let me remember how many dimensions NOMIC has. So if you look at our models, I have 1536 for ADA 02 and then 768 for NOMIC. Okay, so they're actually multiple of each other. But right now I'm storing both these columns. And this way I can rapidly switch between the two. In reality, you'd probably just want to pick an embedding column and stick with it uh, since there is you know, a cost to having lots of embedding columns on your, on your rows. You have to store additional stuff. And then I do also have two indexes, right? So these are two HNSW indexes for efficiently querying these things. And so I have an index for the ADA 2 and an index for the NOMIC. So there's definitely a little bit of cost to being able to easily switch between these embedding models. Uh, but uh, it's really great to be able to do that, at least from a you know uh, prototyping and a local development perspective, right? Uh, so that's that's kind of the one of the ways in which we're making sure that we can use Olama is by being able to switch to a local embedding model.
All right, so that's that's the setup for Olama. And uh, and yeah, so let's actually, let's just test it out, see what happens, right? So I can ask best shoe for hiking. And actually, wait, I'm gonna test it out with the, the simpler flow. So I'm gonna go to developer settings and tell it to use the simple flow just so we can start simple. And definitely one thing that you'll see is that it's pretty slow uh, to answer this question. I'm on a MacBook M1. I you know, don't have like a particularly crazy GPU or anything. It's just, just the standard M1. And uh, yeah, so it'll, it'll take a few seconds. Uh, so, but here we go. This is the answer. And this is from Llama 3.1. And you can see it's got citations, which is really good. That's something that sometimes I've had a hard time with the small language models is getting them to give citations in the right format, but it is giving the citations in the right format so that my UI can render the citations correctly. And it's answering things correctly. Uh, and we can look at the thought process here, right? We say, what's the best shoe for hiking? We use that to search the Postgres, uh, you know, Postgres database to do a full text search. Then we ask the model, which is 3.1 in this case, and say, hey, stick with the sources. Here's how you should do your citations. Here's the question and here's the sources. And we get back a great response. So that's our that's our simple flow. Now I want to show the advanced flow because this is what I would normally use in production, and this is what was trickier to get working with uh, with a llama. So I'm going to say, "What's the best shoe for hiking?" And this one's going to take a little bit longer because it is a multi-stage flow and it involves a uh, uh, few more steps. So we click on this, and now what we see is that the first thing that happens is that we have our query rewriting phase. And this is where we you know, take this user query, we send it to the, a model and say, hey, what is a good search query based off this user query, right? And you can see, um, you know, it didn't actually change very much in this case, it just said best shoe for hiking. Uh, so, you know, that wasn't very impressive in this case. But then, uh, let me go ahead and show you a query like this one. So climbing gear cheaper than $30. So this query rewriting step can also suggest SQL filters that we can apply when we're doing our search. And that's what it's done in this time, this case. So it recommended a search query of climbing gear. And then it also recommended a price filter of less than 30. That's what you can see here. And how we got this is by using function calling. So we we have the function call and we look here, query rewriter. Okay, so this is our function calling definition. This is the OpenAI function calling, you know, way of defining your functions that can be called. So we'd say you can call this search database function. Uh, you should pass in a search query always. And, you know, that's what's going to be used for the full text search. You can optionally pass in a price filter if it seems like the user wants to, you know, filter search results based off a of price. And these are, you know, what can be specified for that object. Uh, you can also optionally pass in a brand filter, and that also has comparison operator and a value, and the required parameters search query. So here we're defining, a, you know, this function that can be called, and this is how we're getting we're getting the model to take the user query and massage it into how, you know, into parameters that we can use to search our SQL database, right? So it said, oh, okay, you should search for climbing gear and then you should filter by price less than 30. So then what we do in the actual uh, Postgres searcher here is that, you know, we build the filter clause based off of what that model outputted and then we can filter when we're doing our vector search and our full text search, and and then we only get back the ones that are cheaper than thirty. Uh, so this is really nice because otherwise we wouldn't be able to answer that question because what would happen is that climber gear would find all this expensive climbing gear and it wouldn't even find the ones that were cheaper than thirty. So the LLM just wouldn't be able to answer it. So now we're able to answer more complex questions, and so we do this with function calling. And I could not get this working with small language models at first uh, because they would always give the wrong, like kind of wrong made up arguments. I'll show my uh, gist where I was comparing this, right? So this was with GB35 versus Llama 3.1. So like, it was just making up a lot of stuff, like making up the, it kind of the way to do it. 
but I got recommendations to use few shot examples. So that's what we do now is I pass in few shots. And this is what the few shots look like for function calling. So we say, oh, here's an example of a user query. Here's what your function call would look like. Here's another example of a user query. Here's what your function call would look like. And now that I have a few shots, I am reliably getting good results from this query writing step. So that's what I'm really excited about was getting that getting that working because for a long time I thought that I just could never do function calling with small language models, but then Olama added support. And then I realized that by adding few shots, we can get uh, much better results when function calling, especially with these small language models. And there was also a really good link chain blog about it, uh, few shot prompting to improve tool, call, tool calling performance. So definitely it's something you wanna look into, especially if you're trying to use different models. Uh, so there we go. And then we get back our response. So yeah, what you can see here is we have a rag that can work fully with a llama. So we're able to use a llama embedding model and a llama chat completion model, and we can do the llama function calling as well. And it all works. Our code is, you know, for the actual chat completions and stuff like that really hasn't changed because we're just using the open AI and uh, endpoints, right? So this open AI endpoint is now, you know, just taking that, oh, it's going to do nomic embed text in that case, right? So we didn't actually have to change, um, you know, much about our our code here, right? You can see I have this uh, thing here that says, oh, okay, if we're doing a llama, that means our base URL is going to be a llama endpoint, and then we don't need a key. So that's that's basically what we had, you know, what I had to change in order to use the uh, local chat completions and local embeddings. Um, and then the tricky things is just making sure that, you know, we're able to get good results from function calling and that for the embeddings that we are, you know, our data is embedded with the same model that we're searching with. And the cool thing about this is that this also means that it can work in code spaces. So in the dev container, I've specified to bring in the Olama feature. And so that means when you open up this code space, so this is basically VS Code in the browser in a containerized dev environment, it actually has Olama. So we can say Olana, Olama run, you know, um, 3.1, is that what we're doing here? Yeah, Olama run 3.1, and it can bring it into the code space. Now, I did have to start this code space up with maximum cores. <laughs> like So you can, when you're clicking on this, you go to code, you say new with options. And then machine type, you want to go to the max. Uh, that's what I recommend in order to have the best results with a llama because it does take a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of RAM and, and memory, all that stuff. So uh, this is a 16 core that I'm using here in order to get the best results. Uh, you know, and then we say we can communicate with it. Uh, and then we can use it here. So in this one, I've got my llama endpoint just pointing at the local host because it's actually inside this code space. So it's on local host. Uh, but I'm using the same model, same embed model. So I just had to make sure that I pull both of these models before before I run them, right? All right, so that one's pulled. I already pulled 3.1, 3 but I'll just do it again just to prove it. Okay, so both of them are pulled. And my .env is set up, pointed at a llama. And I've done these setup steps already. So I can just go here and run the server. And then it is running in code spaces and we can uh, we can click on one of the sample questions here and it goes off, tries to generate the answer. And here, yeah, as you can see, this is interesting, you see a lot of warnings here that uh, it can't find the uh, 3.1 model. So it's doing a lot of defaulting. So this is, this is me cheating. I am cheating a little bit here. Um, so what's happening here is that I have this package, uh, OpenAI Messages Token Helper. And I use this package in order to count the number of tokens that are in our message so that when I'm doing multi-turn conversations, I can make sure I only pass in as many messages that would fit inside the context window. 
So I actually have this like function that will, you know, take in the all the possible messages and it'll just truncate the ones that don't fit inside the context window. So this is necessary when we're using models, since models have limited context windows and a conversation could go very long and we want to make sure that uh, we're only sending in as much as it can take. So the issue is that this token helper needs a, a token counting library and it uses tick token, but tick token is specific to open AI models, right? So how do we count tokens for these other models? Now, uh, there is ways to do it. There's a hugging face tokenizers package that I think you can use. What I'm doing here is I'm just pretending that tick token does work. So this is this is probably you know the, the place where I am cheating here is that I'm just saying like, well, let's just use tick token. Uh, it's good enough. And I think it is actually good enough for local development. I wouldn't do this in production. In production, I would make sure to actually use a tokenizer that was accurate for the model, but for you know development, for prototyping, for comparison, uh, it's probably fine to just pretend that tick token is uh, is similar, you know, the same tokenization, and um, because most times you're not going to run into it, right? Like I haven't run into any issues where I've sent in too much because a lot of times I'm you know in development I'm not doing really really long conversations. Uh, but definitely, if we wanted to make things be really, really compatible with Olama, then we would want to have token counting that also worked with, uh, you know, was specifically correct for those models, right? So we would, we would need a token counter specific to Llama 3.1. Uh, so I think that's possible with a hugging phase tokenizer package, but haven't implemented myself yet. Uh, but yeah, everything else works and works inside a code space. So that means that people that want to start experimenting with RAG, they can do it as long as they have a GitHub account. And I think that's really exciting because it's just making it possible for more people to learn how to RAG, uh, regardless of what access they have to hosted models or TPUs or whatnot. Okay, that's all I wanted to show today. Uh, you know, if you're interested, go ahead and Check out the repo and go, you know, file any issues or send PRs for any improvements you'd like to see. Bye, everyone.